Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Trinity and I'm on the marketing team here at Castora. We're so excited to have you guys joining us to talk about a topic that is definitely top of mind for a lot of marketers today. Um, here at Castora, we've heard a lot of our retailers that we partner with talking about their one-time buyer problem. Um, so we're really excited to be bringing you guys two uh, great practitioners in the space today. Um, so first, uh, leading us off is going to be Corey, our CEO and co-founder, and he's joined by Vicky, our head of customer success at Castora. So today we're going to start off by just introducing this one-time buyer problem and then we're actually going to get into tactical steps to measure your um, repeat customers at this time and then actually solving your one-time buyer problem. Um, we're going to have a Q&A afterwards so uh, feel free to pop in your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel um, right now and we'll answer them at the end um, and we will be sharing the deck and recording. Cool. Thanks, Trinity. Uh, this is Corey. And uh, kicking things off with a little bit about who we are. Um, <clears throat> we are a customer analytics platform that we work specifically with retailers. And uh, there's a whole lot of vendors in the retail marketing landscape. Um, what we provide, what's unique about us, is an obsession with lifetime value and growing lifetime value. Uh, we refer to it as sustainable growth. And by that, we mean that you know, growing revenue without needing to go hardcore on the promotion values, really focusing in on the life cycle stages and using LTV as, as a guiding metric and the tactics that we can help you implement to grow that figure. Um, over the past 15, 20 years, I think all of us in the marketing field have observed an explosion in digital marketing channels. So you, you know, you're reaching out to your customers on Facebook, on email, on display, on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you know, in the 2000, 2010, you saw not only these new channel tools, but a whole lot of channel analytics products come to market as well. Uh, Omniture still is a staple in almost every large retailer we work with today, providing the ever important return on ad spend metric. But when the, uh, when the conversation shifts to talk about customers and to talk about problems like converting one-time buyers into repeat buyers or preventing customer churn, uh, it's a little harder. You know, those, that, those metrics, you know, the churn prevention rate or the one-time buyer conversion rate, they don't really exist in our marketing tools. The channel marketing execution tools aren't really well positioned to, to act on those things and the analytics tools aren't really there. And as a result, customer analytics teams uh, have really tried to kind of plug that gap and, and our whole point is to be a, a piece of technology for, for those teams right at the intersection of analytics and marketing to help bring those customer focused programs to life. Um, so this is the end of the, the Castora intro but just to paint a very uh, simplified picture of the stack where Castora tends to fit is in between the channel execution tools and the state of data. Um, so we're really that interface for the marketers and the analysts to um, to bring together data to support types of programs like we're going to talk about today with the one-time buyer program. Um, we have learned about the one-time buyer pro uh, problem and solutions to the one-time buyer problem by partnering with some really great brands. So you see on this list a combination of up-and-coming you know, new digital brands that are some of the success stories over the past uh, 10 years. You see household names like Ann Taylor and Guess. Uh, that, um, that we've been fortunate to work with. So we've really worked hard to build a best practices guide, a playbook to help walk you through um, how to make progress on the one-time buyer challenge. So with that, we'll shift into the good stuff and while you're here today, um, we also write books. Um, one of the things we wrote recently was a, an entire book on the one and done problem. And to provide a little context here on, on why, we once had a sales conversation with a really large brand where the CMO basically said to us, she was like, you know, if you can solve our one-time buyer program, we have unlimited budget for you. And, you know, as an entrepreneurial guy, I was like, all right, this is cool. Let's, uh, I, I like the sound of that thing. So, um, uh, no, but in all seriousness, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that, um, that, We've yet to meet a brand that, that where this challenge doesn't take up a big part of the mind share, uh, and you know we got some 
uh, some slides to walk through that. I mean, the reality is for almost every brand, the majority, it is much more common than not that people come to your brand for just one purchase. Um, there's a lot of stats on that where, you know, you look at uh, the, you know, small percentage, maybe 25% of your customers are driving over half of your orders, right? And the other side of that shows you that there's a large number of customers that are only coming to the brand once and it's really expensive. It costs a lot of money to acquire customers and when they just go away, um, obviously that doesn't maximize the return on that customer acquisition investment and, and that's really the crux of a lot of the challenges that retailers have with growth today. Um, so we have a little graph to illustrate that point here where the cost of, of driving each incremental order is going up, right? We are all spending more and more money across Google search, across all of these digital channels, and it's getting more and more competitive. So we've got to fight and spend to try to get people on our website or in our door. And at the same time, consumers feeling very empowered, you know, we feel it when we're shopping. It's just kind of hard when we're on the marketing side of this. You know, like there's there's discounts everywhere. Right? How many of us before we we make the purchase are like, oh wait, wait hold on, let me check out Retail Me Not. You know, um, and so the return on each order is going down. There's also this company called Amazon that sells things for really cheap and really low margin. You know, so even if you're not fighting against the promotion, you're fighting against real low margin goods that might be similar to what you're offering. And, and a combination of this, right, more expensive to get the order in, and then a lower return on each order builds what we call a shark graph. And it's really eating away at the growth and at the margins um, that. Um, that we're trying to build, and it's why so many companies out there, uh, life isn't life isn't easy in the retail industry right now. So, uh, the one-time buyer problem is really the first step, right? If you think about the customer life cycle, uh, everything starts with the first purchase. We'll get a little cheesy here, and it's like the first impression, the first date, you know, first time you're hanging out with a friend. Um, you want that experience to be great. You hope that it builds into to, to subsequent purchases, uh, but it doesn't always work out that way um, and and so really the 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 challenge that retailers face here is for something we know first impressions are so important yet it's really really hard thing to optimize because we, we only have one real rich data point you know so here's this picture a new customer and she bought some shoes well great well all we know about her she bought one pair of shoes um, we want to build, roll out the red carpet and give her a wonderful, super uber personalized experience. Um, but you know, putting aside the logistics of how hard it is to kind of kind of pull that on, there's also the insights piece of that. How much do we know about her from that purchase? And I think for a real long time, uh, marketers have really only known, hey, we bought a pair of green shoes, as is the case here. But fortunately, there have been some real significant advancements in the field of data analytics, customer analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning, there's so many buzzwords for it, but basically we're figuring out what to do with the small amount of data points that we're gathering. So along with that first purchase shoe, maybe the shopper also browse some interesting products online. Maybe we also know, oh, what she responded to is actually an exclusive first look or you know, she clicked on a, a black is the new black uh, promotion or whatever the case might be. Right? But all of these data points, what made her click the email to come in, what did she navigate in on the site, how did she make the purchase, right? um, what time of day was it, what day of the week is it, the reality is all of these data points when you rely on your good buddies in the data science field have figured out ways to extrapolate meaning from that, the pattern matching, the machine learning, um, and all of it's kind of building a story. And so the reality is even though you still never have perfect visibility on the person who comes in and just buys one item, there's actually quite a bit more data out there that you can leverage with the right models that can say, hey, you know, maybe if I have five or six main types of shoppers, I'm pretty sure that she's either A or B, you know? And, and so it might not be perfect, but directionally it, it's, it's helpful and um, it makes a big difference. And so um, that's kind of what got us as Castora down this path. We started with, hey, we have some of these insights that we can surface from the very first purchase. But then the questions came into, well, what do we do about it, right? Because it's one thing to have data insights, but data insights don't fix your one-time buyer problem on their own. And so we had to work quite a bit hand-in-hand um, -hand with these retailers trying to figure out, okay, practically, what's actually doable here? Where do we start? How do we measure success? Um, and that's what we're going to get into now. Um, 
So before we get going, we have our first poll of the day. Um, I like how they brand this quick poll. Um, so how would you benchmark your one-time buyer program? Um, and you see a couple of options here that kind of span across the spectrum of um, not doing anything at all, doing the kind of simple things, doing sophisticated things. So we're going to just pause for a quick moment and allow some folks to fill this thing out. Um, and, then, and then we'll keep going. All right, um, so let's close that poll, and I think, are you going to be able to see the results? Yeah, right on. So 20% um, not doing anything yet. All right, well, the easiest place to start is if you're not doing anything yet, so that's great. Um, discussing implementing a strategy, that's even, even cooler for us. Uh, side note, obligatory plug, we're actually offering a pilot of Castora right now focused on this. So if you like what you hear today, we'll, we'll follow up with you later. Um, and a good chunk of you have built some programming around this already, which is awesome. And so we hope that um, you have something to gain. And even the, the small percentage out there that, that have some sophisticated stuff, uh, hopefully there's something that you'll be able to take from, uh, from the variety of things we talk about today. And, and we'd love to hear from you if you're doing some interesting things that we can add to the knowledge center here, whether or not we end up partnering with you. We're just all about helping Helping spread the one-time buyer love. So cool. Um, so first things first. If you're in the marketing department and you're making the case, if it's not already clear to the CMO, there's a whole bunch of stats um, that just talk about how important it is to attract repeat buyers. And so if you're, you know, the, there's the five percent retention improvement increases profits by a ridiculously large amount. There's the it's six seven times more expensive to acquire a new customer than to save an existing one. That top five percent of customers driving thirty to forty percent of revenue. We saw a stat the other day of a big large omnichannel company that said three percent of their customers drive thirty percent of the revenue. And for companies that are struggling to find those growth opportunities, it's all the more reason, right? If you have one of those 3% comes into your brand, a potential one of that, that golden platinum bucket, you, you really can't afford to miss out on those windows, right? You really want to close and have a 100% batting average of getting those types of customers to have that ever important second touch point and to kind of walk up the loyalty ladder. So um, there's a whole lot of research out there from a lot of consulting companies and a lot of data analytics firms that talk about the importance of repeat rates and the importance of getting to purchase number two. Um, so what can we do? We have a, a a kind of a, a sequence of things that, that Vicki and I will walk through now um, and, and really quickly going through the agenda and we'll dive into each of these in turn. The first is setting goals. It, it's as with any marketing program, we can't we, we don't just want to start and say, hey, we're going to fix the one-time buyer program. We got to benchmark where we are. We'll talk about the metrics to do that. They're not the type of metrics, you know, you, you, you can't measure the improvement of your one-time buyer program by looking at your return on ad spend and email alone. Right? You're talking about customers that are converting, especially if you get omnichannel, it gets even, even trickier. So, um, so we're going to talk about how to set goals. Um, and we're going to talk about segmentation. Um, there's a whole spectrum right, of, of uber personalizing every square inch of every piece of communication and kind of broad based segmentation. And there's a lot of practical considerations to keep in mind here of just what is achievable and how much do we know about these customers. But segmentation is going to be the heart of what we put in place to, uh, to start um, getting customers down the right series and down the right tracks to the, to the relevant, um, relevant messaging. Then building and how to build it is where you get into all the, the good, good logistics here. What are we actually talking about? How do I set this up within my email service provider? What do I have to do? Um, there's the deploying and Kind of obvious, just how to get these things done. We're going to get into some concepts like prioritization and overlaying the, the welcome series that are getting richer with your you know holiday emails and how these things jive together. And then finally, just the constant measurement, the measuring the impact on LTV. So all of these things together, kind of are they kind of we think of it as kind of like building the one-time buyer foundation, right? It's not it, it's 
there is no single one thing you can do silver bullet. The best thing you can do is get the infrastructure in place, the operations in place, be measure, measuring for the right things. And then we'll describe some of the tactics that we see working for some of the brands that we work with on top of that. But the first order of business is like setting the foundation. So with that, turn it over to, to Vicki to talk about goal setting. Thanks, Corey. Um, so the, I'm Vicki, and I have the pleasure of working with all of our wonderful Castora customers day in and day out, along with my team, and really helping to tackle this one-time buyer problem. So as Corey alluded to, we take a fairly systematic approach here, and the first thing we want to do is really set our goals. And to Corey's point, when you are thinking about setting goals, the most important starting point is where are you today? And then we chart out that path to get to where you want to be in the future. But definitely having that baseline is uh, step one. So here at Castora, we think about this across three, um, what we think are very important metrics, uh, early repeat rate, predicted lifetime uh, revenue, and predicted lifetime profit. So starting here with the early repeat rate, um, if your organization has a metric like this already, we applaud you. Um, the idea behind this metric is understanding that you're going to be acquiring customers over time. Your business is likely prone to a fair amount of seasonality. And so you want to establish a line in the sand that says, OK, on a monthly basis, when I establish a cohort of customers, how successful am I in getting them to make their second purchase within 60 days or within 90 days? Um, and so when you have this baseline of understanding where you are today, then you can start to think about where do I want to be tomorrow? If right now I'm converting 23% of my one-time buyers on average within 60 days to make a second purchase, well, can I get that to 25% and what's the revenue tied to that? Next, we go to the predicted lifetime revenue. So Corey mentioned before that, you know, we're in the business of really making sure that we're optimizing for the long term. And so one way of thinking about this is the goal of getting more repeat customers, the goal of solving your one-time buyer problem is really to generate even more revenue for the business. And so what we would hope to see is that we put some of these tactics and programs in place. We're getting folks to repeat more often. We're getting more of our one-time customers to turn into two and three and four-time customers. And as such, we're actually lifting the predicted lifetime revenue of our customer base. Um, so again, important to know where you start here, and then you can use that as the baseline for where you want to be in the future. The last piece is actually quite important, which is the predicted lifetime profit. So uh, talking of the difference between long-term and short-term, we can all imagine that one way to increase your early repeat rate uh, is to throw a bunch of promotions out there. Uh, you know, I guarantee you that if you offer 90% off of some of your merchandise, you will definitely increase your early repeat rate. But obviously, we want to keep in, intact the idea of profit and the idea of margin. So, you know, the reality is that you may start to be a bit promotional with some of these tactics. Hopefully, we can have a mix of promotional and non-promotional -prom tactics. But we want to make sure that in the, long t in the long run, in the long term, we're at the very least maintaining the profit per customer. And ideally, we're actually increasing that because we're getting more and more purchases out of each customer. And one small thing to add here, I think the early repeat rate, um, one of the questions that we often get is, well, you know, why, you know, why set the early repeat rate? Like, why not just look at an overall metric of how many customers repeat and turn into repeat buyers and optimize on that? And the challenge is as marketers, right, some of your customers, it is true, some of your first-time purchasers, she's not going to make another purchase for another 12 months. Like, that will obviously happen. Um, however, as marketers, we can't really wait 12 months to optimize, right? Uh, we're going to have some very angry marketing bosses when we're saying, oh, no, no, I'll let you know how the program's doing, just get back to me in a year, and then we'll iterate. Um, and so the early repeat rate is like a leading indicator of that. And so it is usually the case that, you know, let's just pick in numbers, just for example sake, say 20% of your overall customers eventually turn out to be repeat buyers. Um, well, maybe at the 30-day or the 60-day mark, only 12% are, right? But if you improve the early repeat rate, you are also going to improve your overall repeat rate. And so it's just a way to get a little bit faster, but we find that that's super important. A lot of the stuff that we talk about here, we really think of retention as a system, right? There's a flow. There's new customers who come in, and this is the first conversion point, the first drop-off point. 
Um, and as you as an organization are trying to improve that thing, you need much more rapid feedback than waiting, say, 12 months. And so should you pick 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Uh, it depends a little bit on the order cadence of your organization. Um, so if most shoppers, you know, think of, you know, hey, our good customers, when they repeat, they come every month. Maybe 60 days is actually a good ERR for you. Maybe your company, though, that sells more high-end jewelry and, like, you know, the best customers are only once a quarter, then maybe 90 or 100 or 120 even is, is a little bit of a better metric. You don't want to put it too early to where you can't tell anything, but you also want it kind of as early as is practical. Okay, so now we get into the concept of segmentation. And um, there's so many types of segmentation out there. Uh, and, and really the first question of, of customer segmentation is what do we segment on, right? Do we pick, do we segment just based on the single product type that people have bought? We make our product category so broad, you know, men's apparel, women's apparel, that that creates a segmentation. Uh, maybe we have some data in the CRM about where they live, and it's East Coast and West Coast, or maybe we partner with the, the data providers of the world, right, the Axioms, the Experience, the Epsilons, et cetera, and we're, we're kind of adding some third-party data, so we might know the, the gender or the income bucket and all these things. And so really the first place that a lot of organizations start is to say, hey, right now I have a welcome series, and it's treating everyone the same, and I know I want to get better than that. Um, I, on the other hand, Right? We don't have the creative bandwidth, even if we have some personalization technology to try to optimize some of the SKUs. Um, we, you know, for a welcome series, we're trying to really connect, educate these people in the brand, and there's a lot of marketing communication that might be different for someone who buys all athletic wear compared with someone who buys all fashion wear. Right? And it's not just the product SKUs that we're talking about here, but we can't write 100 billion different versions of these welcome series. And so you kind of get in this like, well, huh, and it leads you to this area of segmentation, right? It's a balance. If we can define the three or four types of customers that kind of three or four groups that really do represent distinct different types of shoppers, you can imagine for the aspect of the creative, the brand, the, the kind of the, the brand connection that you're trying to forge over the series of communication, you can imagine having a few versions of that. Um, so this is not instead of the SKU optimization, that awesome widget that just prints money that's going somewhere in your email thing, but it's, you know, think about the email real estate, that's kind of one small part of it. We really want to, to kind of aim bigger and broader with this ever important first, um, uh, first impression that we're going to set over the first few weeks of the customer's life. And so then you get into that, all right, well, if I'm going to make two or three just to start, two or three versions of this stuff, and we'll talk a little bit more about the series later, yet you, you get to this part, and then you say, all right, well, what are we segmenting on? And so we are big believers as a data analytics company um, that um, you should kind of start with the data. However, we are not believers that marketing and segmentation is only a data-driven exercise. It is a mix of art and science. And so... Um, what we do on the science side, there's a type of segmentation that we call shopper type or persona segmentation. Um, that's a, a bit of a loaded word in, in, in most retail departments. But what we're talking about here is um, let's open up the closet of every single repeat buyer that we see there in the population and look at the collection of things that they have bought. And that's where you'll see, hey, you know what, some customers have bought mostly athletic wear. Uh, apparel, shoes, et cetera, et cetera, equipment, right? And then there's another group of customers that seems to be very professional, a lot of suits and business wear, and another type that's like very, you know, fashion focused, right? So um, we start with the data and we look at the ordering behavior because those are the most prominent actions that customers can take. And what you will often see is that there are a handful of groups of customers, like I just described, the athlete, the professional, the, the fashion customer. And in most cases, um, there are not super strong demographic correlations with, with any one of them. So, for example, if you were looking at 20 to 30-year-old females, you'd have 20 to 30-year-old females in all three of those groups. Things get a lot more distinct and real, you know, sizable segments that are very actionable, that are engaging with your brand for very different reasons um, when you do this kind of order item clustering segmentation first. Um, so... But the first step is whatever it is, right? If you have a kind of a nice, sweet, advanced segmentation model like Persona or even thinking of, hey, start somewhere, male versus female, right? Like based on what they bought. Um, 
the the thinking here is that what we're going what we're working towards is that we're going to kind of build a different program, a different type of communication to welcome this person to the brand, and it all starts with um, with the method of of segmentation. So once you have that data driven approach, we do like to layer in the rest. So I mentioned that demographics don't always have the answer. What a lot of our customers have done though is taken these shopper types and seeded surveys with them online or focus groups with them. Um, and it can be super, super interesting to kind of see, and, and it really brings to life um, when you put these two things together. Because now you're saying, hey, not only am I seeing in the data that these different types of shoppers exist, but now I'm talking to them and I'm learning about them and I understand and hear from them their motivations of joining and, and being a customer, right, coming to the brand. And that really can seed a lot of the creative ideas with what do we want to lead off with, with this series of communication that we're going to put together. So we're big believers in this art and science thing together. Um, but I guess I'd say like we're big believers in science and art instead of art and science, right? But um, but the two things work, work together. Um, Okay, so just diagram here that's kind of illustrates the same thing, right? And and I you know I use super broad examples of athlete and fashion and professional, and but it's uh, for a lot of brands it's not quite so basic, right? Like there are customers that only buy in the spring, or there are customers that only buy in our traveler collection, or there are customers that are professional, but you know there's different types of professional customers. There's like the super traditional, and then there's the the more like hip, you know, we're a startup in New York City, nine to five styling kind of thing. Um, so for every brand it is different, but um, still like the data driven stuff when you really dig in and you apply the lens that you as marketers have what these products mean, um, these segments really come to life. Um, so some examples of emails that we've seen customers send, um, you know, you, you've got, you know, take a look at this as an outdoor company here and just, you know, you've got some emails that are very you know outdoorsy mountain climbing expedition focused and you've got others that are like you know stay at home and be warm right so for coming in that sells a lot of apparel it's a great example of in some of these cases the same brands might even be worn by both of these types of customers but when you paint a whole picture of what they buy obviously the person climbing Mount Everest is going to buy slightly different stuff and probably is responding to this brand and, and shopping at the store for a very different reason than the person who's living up in you know the Northeast in the winter who's just looking for like kind of fashionable and really really warm clothing um, but you know if you had your way and you were building a welcome series and and you knew that those were two different customers you would very likely create a very different welcome series for each um, and that's what segmentation is going to kind of lay the groundwork for awesome so now let's talk about how you build this thing out. Uh, what we're going to start with is what may be your standard, um, let's say this is email, this is your email marketing calendar. And so you have the plans to talk to everyone in your database about new arrivals, about your spring promotion, and you know, even some influencer-based marketing. And so to Corey's point, what we've done so far, what you've done is you've identified these personas. You've realized that there are true differences between customer types. Um, and so you want to start to speak to these customers in a very different way, in a way that will be most impactful to them. So what might that look like? Well, instead of doing uh, one version, that one size fits all, you're actually going to pull together an entire series. And not only are you going to pull together one series, but you're going to pull together two series. And this is all based on what you know about the customer. So in all of that persona analysis and all of that fun data and customer analytics, you've actually uncovered the fact that you have two different types of customers. You have your athlete and you have your trendsetter. And so what we're seeing here is we're really starting to differentiate the messaging. This is still our welcome series, um, and we're still going to have you know, two to three touch points, but those touch points are going to start to feel very different. Um, so in, you know, for the athlete, you're going to talk to them about sports, whereas in the trend trendsetters, you're going to talk to them about design. In week two, the athlete is going to learn all about, um, you know, how to engage in social media, whereas the trendsetter, maybe she or he is slightly more um, likely to be on Instagram and maybe they're slightly more price sensitive. So that's all about Instagram and exclusive sales. The idea being here that you're starting with the data and you're starting to personalize the message. Again, this is not ultra personalization one-to-one -one, and might, we might argue that it doesn't need to be, but at least you're starting to be more relevant. 
What's next? Um, so this is our favorite thing. Spice it up with some triggers. Um, why are triggers fantastic? Uh, two reasons. One is that they're kind of set it and forget it. You're going to build out some business rules. You're going to make some decisions and you're going to automate those things within your email service provider. And the second reason why they're awesome is that you don't have to go begging your creative team for unique assets week over week and month over month because you're going to de develop something that's fairly evergreen. Maybe it's something that only needs to be changed out on a seasonal basis. And so when we spice it up with those triggers, um, what types of triggers are we talking about? There's two main buckets, although you can go far beyond this. You can think about these in terms of promotional triggers. So maybe you start to understand that the purchase cadence for the athlete and the trendsetter are quite different. And so at some point in time, if the athlete or if the trendsetter hasn't gone on to make the second purchase, maybe that's a time to get a little bit promotional um, and see if you can drive that second purchase. The second one, which is even more exciting, is the cross-sell. So, you know, you're going to start to have an understanding of, okay, so that, that athlete that came in and bought a pair of running shoes, those other people that came in and bought running shoes, what else did they go on to buy? You know, maybe they went on to buy, I don't know, they went on to buy some clothing and some shorts and headbands, because you always need a headband when you go running. Um, and then the trendsetter is a little bit different. So you want to play with both of these types of triggers, again, getting to that promotional and non-promotional um, the cross-sell and the promotional triggers. So what might this look like? For the athlete series, um, you've gotten to know a lot about that customer base and the purchasing patterns and the personas, and so you know that they're often likely to respond to some workout gear, so you're gonna set that trigger. Week one, if that customer hasn't gone in to make a purchase on week one, you're going to hit them with the trigger that talks about workout gear, and so on and so forth. For the trendsetter, that person, again, we talked about this a little bit before, slightly more price sensitive, um, also maybe have purchases more frequently. So if they haven't made a purchase after week one, or maybe this is month one for your brand, um, then you might want to hit them with something that's promotional and also relevant. So you see here like a 15% off of NITS trigger. But that's the idea. So it's not a single touch point that's going to get them to make their second purchase. It's a series. It's not just giving them the one size fits all welcome series or the one size fits all promotional calendar, editorial calendar, but it's really getting specific and using this combination of series as well as triggers to have a very personalized communication strategy with two different customer bases. Yeah, and, and just to uh, reiterate a couple of things that you just talked about, some stuff that we've seen here, you know, I mentioned the art and the science, and so uh, we've worked with some brands here where Okay, great. We found. Um, I'll go back to the other example. It's just a, a as a as a theoretical example, right? Where we had like the adventure customer, the adventure persona, and the stay at home and be warm persona. Um, what we have found through um, either just the marketer's intuition, which is often right, or even better through the surveys, is you really find that these different groups of customers are coming to your brand for very very different reasons. And uh, Vicky mentioned, you know, the promotion, the, the sensitivity. Are they coming to your brand because it's a place where we could buy things for cheaply? Or are they coming because, like, you, you know, like you get me, right? Like, you could imagine that adventure segment is not price sensitive. Um, you can imagine uh, that they would be most responsive. If you are forming that impression over the first month, that series, there's going to be a lot of really awesome nature pictures of Kilimanjaro and Patagonia and all those other, you know, Antarctica hikes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, like, it's... Like that's what we're talking about here, right? As as a way that you want, you are forming that impression. Whereas the stay at home, you got the family, you have got the people in the snow. There's a dog out there. Hot you know, cocoa. You, yeah, hot cocoa. Like there might be a little more price sensitivity. You know, like there's, uh, you know, and because uh, you're buying for a family, and uh, you know, these are we're being cheesy intentionally here. But the the important thing to to note, I think, is where we have seen those early repeat rates rise is when that combination of A, picking the right segments that are truly distinct is there, and B, we really do create, craft a narrative, right? This narrative, this is going to layer on top of, and in some cases, replace daily emails or, you know, or, or, or be in addition to, but it is, like, for it to resonate, it's a consistent narrative that you are building for each of these two series, and then, yeah, then the triggers just kind of spice that up and, and get those conversions a little bit higher. Um, so it's a good segue and uh, great. So hey, you know we're starting here. We're not going to do this all over the place. We're starting with our, fa our our athletes and our fashion customers, or our adventurers and our and our I want to be warm at home group. Um, we've really understood why these people come to the brand. We've built out these series. You know maybe it's uh, ten emails. 
over the course of a month or, or, or every, an email a day for a week or two. You know, it's all different kinds of things to experiment with. We've got it all done. Now you get to deployment. And there's there's a couple of gnarly things, right? We talked a lot about theoretically, hey, I got persona this and I got persona that. Um, you set up the series. Um, the nuts and bolts can get a little bit um, tricky and intimidating. Um, and so, um, first of all, um, you have this notion of prioritization. So do you want the welcome series to, to trump everything, right? Is it the case that if you are a new customer that you do, you do not get the daily emails, um, you only get this? Or will you send the welcome series and the daily emails, right? Um, and so there's a couple different options there. And, and I don't think that there is a universal right or wrong. I think our advice would be if you are going to be sending the dailies and the welcome, call it out to your customers. Say, hey, in addition to you receiving the daily emails, we're also going to send you a series of emails um, that are you know, just about getting to know you or you getting to know us, us introducing ourselves to you, uh, asking for that kind of uh, permission, if you want to call it that. Um, that uh, tends, to, tends to, to be a little bit more effective. We've seen slightly better results from doing it that way. Um, but it's a decision that you need to make. Then, um, what we have seen to be most effective, nearly every major ESP right now supports a welcome series and some sort of workflow where you can kind of triage customers into one series or another. So we're oversimplifying things. And again, we could, we could geek out about this later. We'd love to. Uh, but um, imagine if you had the adventure segment and the stay at home, stay warm segment. Those would be set up as two different series, right? And, and effectively, what you need to do is communicate with the ESP on which customers uh, belong in you know, series adventure versus series um, stay warm. And, um, and so the, the nuts and bolts of that, I mean, it, it, it depends, right? Obviously, there's platforms like Castora that help with that, uh, but you could do it homegrown too, right? You just have to have those scripts of, hey, who joined the brand yesterday? And you have to have, if you're not using an advanced segmentation model or whatever, if you're doing it in-house, however advanced your model is, you got to run it, you know, kind of tag the customers belonging in one group or, or another. And then that stuff has to get into the ESP, right? So think about, think about that. You know, that might sound a little intimidating. There's a few steps set up, but it's really just the setup stuff. And it's not hard. Like every ESP takes files. And, you know, these things already are feeding into your email provider. What you're really just doing is kind of getting that 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 uh, the nuts and bolts set up and the and the, the wires all connected, so that as new customers are flowing in, they get put into the right bucket and these series start on time. Um, next one is keeping the segments up to date. Now, with most ESPs, again, you're going to be able to set kind of an exit rule, i.e., if the customer makes an order, they pop out of the series, right? If you want. Right, so with a win-back promotion, right, a separate webinar topic that we should, you know, we'll, we'll send, we'll, we'll do that one soon, right, about how to save customers without using so many promos. It's another topic that's near and dear to our heart. You know, but then if in the middle of the win-back they buy an item, you want to stop the win-back program. With an educational thing, it's not necessarily um, needed, right, especially if this is all about introducing you to the brand it's, and you've said, hey, we're going to be sending you a series of stuff just to get to know you and let us know if it's relevant, you know, good dialogue, two-way communication. Um, you don't have to necessarily stop it when someone makes an order, but some brands decide to. But th those are these are the kinds of, of things that you're gonna want to go through uh, in your in your checklist. But usually it's like a hey, who bought an order today? Let's get that file into the ESP. Let's make sure the rules are set up um, to keep this thing going. And then um, we get into the measurement. Yeah. And before we get into the measurement, we have another fun poll. All right, so. Big question. Corey just talked about geeking out, so here we go. My favorite part. How do you measure the effectiveness of marketing campaigns today? Uh, maybe you're looking at total revenue, revenue per user, incremental revenue other. We will give folks a chance to answer this guy and come back.
All right. So um, thanks for everyone to, for taking the poll. And it looks, wow, this is fascinating. Okay, so we have 37% on the total revenue, which happens to be tied with incremental revenue. Definitely going to chat about that. Some folks looking at revenue per user, some folks looking at other. Fascinated to know what the other is, so feel free to chat us to tell us what that is. Um, but awesome. So how what's our approach here at Castora in terms of measurement? So we are strong believers in holdout groups and in A-B testing. So let's start with holdout groups. Um, had the pleasure of working with many marketers and even being in the marketer's chair myself once. And my favorite question that I get from CFOs, from my merchant team, you name it, is how do you know that customer wasn't going to shop anyways? How do you know that it's because of this awesome personalized one-time buyer welcome series that we've put in place that this is what's driving these this, in, this increased revenue? Um, and the answer to that is really the holdout group. And so what you see here is this awesome visualization. Um, you're going to identify this group of customers. It's your trendsetters or it's, it's your athletes, it's your adventurers or your stay at home warm people. Um, awesome. And you're gonna identify that group of people and you're going to implement the series for almost all of them. You're gonna withhold a certain group of people that you're gonna treat them the way you've always treated every customer. And what you're really trying to gather here is what is the true impact of going down this path of having a differentiated um, one-time buyer or welcome series and how am I moving the needle? And by comparing what the group that is getting the business as usual email, by comparing that group to the group that's now getting this super enhanced series, that's where we're gonna understand, well, what is the true impact of having something like this um, automated and personalized welcome series in market? The second question you're going to get all the time is, well, I wonder if this other offer or this other creative would have been even better. And so the way we're going to answer that is A-B testing. So you can take, in addition to having that holdout group, you can take the rest of the population and split them down the middle or split, split them three ways and test different creatives and test different offers and different subject lines. Um, we are fans of all of this. This is truly where we geek out. And so... Um, we want to measure that and, and really prove out the effectiveness of having a program like this in place. Um, and so there's really important to think about measurement in both two ways. When we talked about this idea of incrementality and how do you know the customer wasn't going to shop anyways, what we're really honing into there is for each of these emails that we've inserted and added to the email marketing calendar, everything you see on the, your screen right now in red and in green, we're gonna look message by message and see what is the lift and what is the incremental revenue of the people that got business as usual versus, or the people that didn't get this mes messaging versus the people that did. That said, we wanna take this all the way full circle to the baseline metrics that we outlined in the beginning of our wonderful webinar, which is, we want to look at this at the series level as well. The goals that we set out when we started was that, hey, we're going to draw a line in the sand of this early repeat rate that helps us understand um, how we're doing and converting our one-time buyers. We want to understand what our baseline customer lifetime value is and what that is from a profit standpoint. And so now we want to look across the series and say, what is this doing? Are we increasing our early repeat rate? Are we are we increasing our lifetime value in terms of both revenue and profit? Um, and so that's how we're going to think about measurement here at Castora and would encourage folks to think about it in the same way as well. We found it to be very impactful. Yeah, and, and like, you know, there's a lot of you said total revenue and, and revenue per user. And, um, uh, revenue per user, if you're talking revenue per user uh, over the span of the series is, is a good starting mm -hmm. point. But what we see a lot of folks do is just say of the direct emails, right? I've got five emails in my email you know, system, and for every single one of them, I look at email per recipient, or sorry, revenue per recipient on a, on a message by message basis. And you're kind of micro optimizing in that case, right? Like the fifth email might be really low, or maybe the first email is really low, but that's actually just because the person just bought something, you know? And like, so sure, it's much more likely for email number seven, it's two weeks later to get something, but that's because the purchase cadence kind of corresponds with that. There's all kinds of reasons why just isolating one message isn't that good. And when you take and you put the measurement back on the customer, right, really what we're testing here is customers that are going down different tracks. And you want to know, does going down one of these tracks, is it better than, than, than the status quo? And so metrics like the early repeat rate that, that Vicky talked about hit that. 
Um, if you're only looking at revenue, right, you might just put more expensive items, but you might you actually could convert fewer users in your welcome series. But because you emphasize items that were a little more expensive, maybe revenue stayed flat. Or revenue went up a little bit. And sure, that's good. I mean, we all like revenue, right? <laughs> um, but you know, long term wise, you're not actually solving your one-time buyer you know problem all that much necessarily, right? You got some of those orders, some of those new orders. Um, we're, we're worth a couple more dollars. That's that's good. But our, our primary goal here is to forge that second touch point. It's that conversion rate, and that conversion rate is macro, right? It's across. It's how many people got to purchase too. So if you're not, if you have no simple way to measure, am I improving my early repeat rate? Am I getting more of these new buyers to actually transact, right? Like you're you're almost uh, optimizing for some of the secondary metrics first when you when you jump immediately to the to the to the to the total revenue from the email program. Not to mention, if you're an on-the-channel company, the revenue from your email is not the full picture, right? Like, think about Google and paid search and all the effort that Google does to tell you how important paid search is for offline conversion. And, like, they're not crazy. Like, it does make an impact. When we see these things, if you're a customer, especially with holidays coming up, not everybody's going to be buying the thing in you know, from the from the email directly. First of all, they may look at the email at work, come home, and then just directly type in the URL while your ESP doesn't track that revenue. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they might go to the store and buy the thing and the ESP doesn't track that revenue. So when you, again, when you really put the context of measurement around the individual person, the user, um, and you're tracking the simple metric of how many people got from purchase one to purchase two, it's a far more meaningful metric for you to optimize and for you to measure your success. Um, all right, so I think um, a couple things, and then we have a couple minutes for questions, and I think a couple of them have come in, and so um, you know, keep asking those. We'll get to those in a sec. I mentioned this earlier, right? If you're interested in figuring out what your segments are, you want a quick way, you know, to to go at this. I think over half of you said, "Hey, we're really thinking about this, but we haven't quite put the plans together." Well, we would love to boost, uh, you know, kind of help you hit that uh, hit that target. With a little more haste, and um, especially in holiday time, I think this is one of the most um, uh, this is of all times in the year with the influx of new customers that are coming in, starting now through the whole holiday season. Um, we tend to spend a whole lot of time with our partners, really thinking about these welcome series and putting them in place now in November and December, so that come Jan and Feb, um, we're able to, to reap the return on all the holiday investment a little bit more. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We would love to chat. Um, and yeah, cool. Um, and with that, um, let's shift to some Q and A. Um, so um, the first question we've got is: We have a pretty basic series in place, um, but we're a small team. And so, what is the first type of segmentation that we should do to improve our program? All right. Well, um, small team. I guess there's a couple ways that come to my mind, Vicky. Yep. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. But like the, um, you know, one thing you can do as a small team is, of course, partner. That's why there are so many of us tech vendors, right? And we can help. So even if the team is small, we can at least help kind of figure out what are those prominent segments that are going to get you the most bang bang for your buck. Um, there's a variant of that question, which is like, hey, I want to start simple. Yeah. I don't want to talk to another vendor. Uh, you know, um, how, how can we just uh, how can we just get into it? And um, and uh, and there, I would say, if you're gonna segment, my general rule of thumb is start like actions speak louder than demographics, yeah. right? So start with what the people bought. You know your business, like real high level. Maybe there's two main categories of products that you think are gonna be correlated with different types of shoppers. Um, start there and yeah. try to build it, um, and, and you know that that would be my place where if I was going to start simple, and then start with the series being simple, just like three, four emails for each of these types. Um, kind of just put the basic building blocks in place, and go from there. Great. Oh, here's a question, Corey. Ready? Yeah. Where can I download the one-time buyer book? Did you write a book? <laughs> What a leading question. Um, yeah, we, uh, we have it on. Uh, we'll, we'll send out the, the link. It's castora.com slash um, one and not done. Um, you know, one and not done, as in, you know, one purchase, but not done purchasing yet. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, but we'll send that out. Another question just came in saying, what channels other than email can you use? Any best practices? Yeah, Ooh. awesome. I mean, we this you're like calling out something we forgot to put into the slides. Exactly. Um, so 
um, there's been a lot of really cool advancements with things like um, uh, Facebook custom audiences and DMPs are finally starting to take like the ability to kind of upload email addresses and stuff. Google customer match. Google customer match. There's all kinds of things now that are making it a lot easier to take this list of emails and get some consistent targeting across um, across different channels. So if we go back to like the adventure versus the stay warm <laughs> segment. Um, you can imagine it's not like I wouldn't go crazy and try to figure out all right well email one and two and three and four at these specific messages so let's perfectly align a creative that's going to show up on Facebook with those messages wouldn't go that crazy but take the two audiences that are built around these two different things and build the, the handful of creatives usually a little easier if you're talking about Facebook and upload that custom audience yeah. um, it's another thing Vicky mentioned like A-B testing Great, we have our whole doc group that was just going to get status quo. We have another group that's only going to get email, and then we have another group that's going to get email and the Facebook together. Again, like kind of stepping back and looking at the ERR rates of those three cohorts and the conversion rates and, yes, revenue and profit margin per user. Um, but if we look at those three groups now, what you're going to be able to do is really cool because you can come in and you can say, look, compared with doing nothing, we're adding this much, and hey, is that additional money I'm spending on Facebook driving enough incremental conversions that I can mm -hmm. do that mm -hmm. right like sometimes we get a little nervous about like trying to measure cross-channel stuff it's actually pretty simple when you're talking about your one-time buyers because this is like a pool of customers that you know and you've got just you know divided into segments and, and you do different things in each segment and so um, so yeah but absolutely the short answer is um, custom audiences display and Google custom match are like the three things that we're seeing a lot of uh, cross-channel action going on All right, and Vicki, next one is yes. for you. Um, how can we start measuring the early repeat rate? Great question. So um, going back to kind of what Corey said, kind of two avenues here. Avenue one is vendors can help with these types of things. I happen to know one. Um, and to help you understand what is your early repeat rate. The other way you can think about this, and our best practice is to start to think about your customers on kind of that cohort level. Cohort could be, you know, in a given month, how many customers are acquired. Um, and then you want to look two months down or three months down again, figure out what's most relevant for your business and say, okay, so all those customers that I acquired in December, it's now February. How, what percentage of those customers have made a repeat purchase? So that's the idea of the early repeat rate. Um, and you're just going to do that month over month and, and keep that window consistent, whether that window is 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Again, if you're luxury, maybe it's all the way out at 120 days. Um, I will say we often get the question of, like, what's the right amount of time? Um, and there are some ways of doing this. Uh, you know, let's take everyone who made their first purchase in December last year. And let's look at the ones that went on to make a second purchase. When did they make that second purchase? Oh, for the vast majority of them, it was 60 days later. All right, well, then that's a place to start. I think the idea with early repeat rate, it's not so much about whether it's 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. The idea here is, one, establishing your baseline, establishing your starting point, um, the thing that you're going to measure against once you put all of these awesome programs up and running. And two, to what Corey said is, to ensure that you have an ability to measure success um, and understand the efficacies of all of these programs quickly and easily without waiting a whole year to say, well, last year, uh, you know, 75% of my customers were one and done, and this year it's been 70. Um, a year is a very long time to wait to understand whether the actions you're taking are, are impactful. So that's how we think about that. Yep. And I think we've got time for maybe one more quickly. Um, how can we find our businesses? personas. Um, so we talked a little bit about this in terms of right, you might have an advanced analytics team um, in-house and if you want to leverage them then I, I think the guidance that you can push them towards is to focus on um, the items that people are buying as the starting point of the segmentation exercise as opposed to some of the other attributes um, and then you know layer in the rest. Um, uh, kind of uh, beating the same drum here but obviously there's the vendor side and then um, and then the other thing just piggybacking on a question that I think we we talked about a little while earlier which is um, yes it's great if you can if you have a, a partner or if you have a team in-house that can get you to that shopper type action but if you can't 
um, you can still proxy it. You know, take a look, just pull up 20 customers who have bought a whole bunch of stuff and see what kind of patterns <laughs> exist, right? I mean, ideally do more than 20, but you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying. And then, and then you can think about, hey, like look at what their first purchases were, right? There's some exercise that you could spend a couple of days doing and basically set up a, a series of rules. It's not going to be as perfect as a super robust thing, but you might be surprised at what you find. And some of the, for some of our brands, I think like some of these shopper types are so pronounced mm -hmm. that even a look at a hundred customers, like a couple of the things like will we'll shout out you pretty loudly. And then you can still kind of build the creatives for these things and figure out, all right, well, uh, let's set up some rules to put you in one bucket or the other. Um, so not perfect, but there are small steps you can do um, if you're looking to start in a simple way. All right. I think we have reached the end of our window. So thank you guys for coming. Again, please do reach out if you have any questions about anything today. If you'd like to talk to us about help with your one-time buyer uh, problem, um, we'd love to chat. We'd love to help. Um, and we really, really would love your feedback on the webinar in general. Um, we like putting these on, but we want to make sure that they stay relevant. Um, so uh, please don't be shy. Thanks. Thanks.